Okay, so today we're going to talk about heart conditions, particularly ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, blood pressure disturbances for hypertension and hypotension. And of course, uh, we're going to talk about uh, different conditions that leads to shock, right? So first, let's review the, uh, the anatomy of the heart. As everybody knows, the heart is found behind the sternum, right? This is the sternum, or what we call the chest plate, okay? And the sternum has three basic parts. What do you call the upper part of the sternum? Manubrium. Then the body. And then what's the bottom portion of the sternum? Siphoid process. So the siphoid process is what the lowest part of the sternum that divides like a letter V here, right? We have the rib cage. So the heart is just found behind the sternum. It's retro sternal. Retro means behind. Now everybody do this. Form a fist. And your fist, they say, is as big as your heart. Okay? So if you put your fist in front of you, that would be more or less the size of your heart, but pretend it's behind the sternum. Okay? So obviously, a patient with chest pain, what would you consider? A heart condition. It could just be purely angina. Angina pectoris, for the word pectoral means breast and chest. And then, of course, angina means pain, chest pain. Okay? Now, we also said that, and if the pain radiates from the chest into the shoulder, the arm, upper or forearm, the hand, and the jaw, then it could possibly be a referred pain whereby the pain is most likely due to what organ involved, the heart. If the chest pain is associated with breathing, maybe it could be a what? A heart, lung condition, like pulmonary embolism, for example. Remember, we talked about this before, when there's a blood clot in the saphenous vein or the leg veins, is it possible for it to travel to the right side of the heart and then to the lung? And it gets stuck in the lung, why? Because the smallest blood vessels are found there. We call them pulmonary capillaries, right? The clot is big, the pulmonary capillaries are very small, they can only allow the passage of one red blood cell through. So it gets stuck there in the lung, it's called pulmonary embolism. Any clot on the veins, the vena cava, the right atrium, right ventricle will end up in the lung. And we talked about this before, if the clot is on the left side of the heart, then it could travel anywhere because of the aorta. It could go to the brain, develop a stroke involving the brain, which means the clot from the left side of the heart, the left ventricle goes to the brain, or it could go to any organ, the kidney, liver, where you have an aorta with an artery, corresponding artery. So we know the heart has four chambers, right? What are the four chambers of the heart? You have what? The right atrium, right? What else? The right ventricle, the, the left atrium, and then what? The left ventricle. We also know that the heart has, in the wall of the heart, has three layers. What are these three layers? The innermost layer in the wall, what goes that? Endo means from within. Endocardium, cardio means heart. Second layer, which is the thickest layer, would be what? Myocardium. It comes from two words, which means myo means muscle, cardio means heart. And that's the reason why we call the heart a muscular pump. It's a pump that's made of muscle mostly. And what's the third layer? Epicardium. Epi means outside or upon. And we know cardio means heart. Now what is another name for epicardium? Which one, visceral or visceral? Visceral, visceral <laughs> pericardium. And followed by the parietal pericardium, right? And then eventually the fibrous pericardium. The visceral layer and the parietal layer of the pericardium of the, uh, basically is what we call the serous pericardium, remember? There are more or less three distinct serous membranes in the body. In the pleura, it's called visceral and parietal pleura. In the heart, it's called visceral and parietal pericardium. In the abdominal cavity, you have the visceral and parietal peritoneum. And we know for a fact that serous membranes secrete what? Serous fluid. And in this particular case, what is the name of the fluid called? Pericardial. Don't you love anatomy? I fell in love with anatomy, especially when I was a young boy when I wanted to study the brain because I was fascinated what is the best basis for intelligence and memory? 
So up to now, since I was nine years old, I've always had this deep relationship with anatomy. I love anatomy and you should love anatomy too. Because that is your career as future nurses. You have to be not just good, but an expert. A nurse who is smart and competent is an expert in anatomy. We do not want average nurses. We want the best in the West because you come from West Coast. <laughs> now, therefore, what is the name of the space between the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium? Yes, Kelly, Ms. Romero. What do you call the space between the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium? What is it? Yes? Karen Ong? Pericardial sac? Pericardial what? Sac. Sac? Well, the sac refers to the membrane itself. Now remember, in the field of medicine and whatever field you study, we always want to use precise words, accurate words. Why? To, f to avoid what? Misunderstanding and misconfusion, right? There's a word. What's another word for space? Pericardial what? Of course! <laughs> How can we forget the word cavity? What it's all about, cavity? Is that a very simple word? Yes, but we do forget, right? Can we afford to forget that? No, we can't. Now, what is found inside that cavity? Anyone? Okay, and what is the name of the fluid? OMG for Dr. G. Don't you just love anatomy? Everything is so simple. It's called K-I-S-S. What is K-I-S-S? Keep it simple, student. Why do you have to make it complicated when the word complicated is only used in Facebook? Remember relationships? Facebook complicated. Joke only. So in other words... I do the same thing at UCLA. I tell the students, keep it simple, student. So one time I was asking them, what is found inside the blood vessel? And they were looking at each other if it's a very difficult question. <laughs> and they were trying to, and they finally one said, blood, of course, <laughs> give me five. <laughs> What's found inside the air sac in the lung? Yeah. See, you're smarter than the UCLA medical students I have. It took them five seconds to think and air, because I went to another group, you know, or blood or what, okay? The bottom line is that in life, if your perception of things is simple, it becomes simple. The problem is that you, you see a lot of things to read and you already over, oh my God, it's so hard. It's so difficult, and in fact, as long as you know what to study, and you have developed that ability to determine which one is important and which is not. Remember I told you learning is like doing gold mining. You go to the river bank, you have the shifter, you wanna get rid of what? The rocks and the pebbles, and where do they throw them? In the trash can, right? But you look for the gold. Gold is actually what? The relevant information that will be what? Useful to you as a future nurse. And I said the guide would always be what? The learning outcomes or objectives at the beginning of this chapter or the outline in the book. Okay, going back to the heart, therefore. So, what is the purpose of the pericardial fluid? Anybody? Okay, to prevent friction or to reduce friction? Again, is there a difference between prevent and reduce? Spelling alone is different. And the meaning is also different. Can you actually prevent friction? No, because why? The membranes are in contact with each other. The presence of that fluid will can only what? Reduce the friction. Remember the example I gave in, in anatomy when you were my former student? I said, it's like your natural KY, right? <laughs> I always get the same reaction. When I say KY, why, why do you always laugh when you say KY? It's because it is used when you have sex with a pa patient. <laughs> <laughs> Not with a patient, your partner, okay? <laughs> exactly, it's horrible, right? Imagine. <laughs> An eight-year-old patient. <laughs> uh, ma'am. 
Do you know that the, uh, the pericardial fluid is going to... Uh, so essentially, so I think it's the same analogy. In sex, when a woman is what they call dry, what happens during sex? It's going to be what? Of course, because there's a lot of friction. So do this with your hand. So hot, so warm. So same thing. When you have sex with a woman who's dry, doesn't have any lubricant or natural what? <laughs> Mucus fluid there, what happens? There's a lot of pain. And how do I know because the woman will be looking at my face? <laughs> Honey, are you done? <laughs> Same thing with the heart. When there's not enough pericardial fluid, what do you think happens? Every time the heart pumps blood, what do you think will happen? Tick, jig, tick, jig, tick, jig. Why? There's so much friction. Something similar to this. Tick, jig, tick, jig, tick, jig, tick, jig, tick, jig, tick, jig. Can you imagine the heart pumps and it, every time it pumps, it, there is no reduction of the friction because there's not enough what, pericardial fluid, right? Can anybody remember, based on your anatomy background, how much fluid would you expect in a very simple way? How thick should the fluid be? Yes? Anybody? Especially those who were my former students in anatomy. What did I, what is the this comparison I made? It's like what? How thick is the pe Yes? Who are my former students here? Raise your hand. Who are my former students? <laughs> They, they immediately forgot me. I know you who you are. Yes? The three of you there at the side here, I know. No, not this one, not these people. I don't necessarily remember your faces. Uh, only the three people. Oh, they're at the back there too. Yes, my dear? Huh? How thick should the paper be? Oh, I'll give you all the answer. It's paper thin. Very thin. <laughs> What happens when you have pericarditis? What exactly is, do you mean by the word pericarditis? Yes. Come from two words, pericardium. Itis means inflamed. Which one is inflamed? So when an organ or tissue is inflamed, will there be excessive amount of fluid produced? It's called pericardial effusion. E-F-F-U-S-I-O-N. Will that affect the pumping action of the heart? Yes or no? Of course, can you imagine the heart surrounded with so much pericardial fluid? Will it be able to affect the pumping action of the heart? It will restrict the heart. It will compress the heart to so that it will affect what? The pumping action of the heart. That's called pericardial effusion. In our knowledge of medicine, the most common cause would be what? Infection. Like when you have pericarditis due to a bacterial or viral infection. Or it could be malignancy that has spread to where? to the pericardium of the heart. That's why, what's the procedure we do? What, do? what kind of, what fluid will we get from the heart? The pericardial fluid. And what procedure are we going to perform? Dr. Gamma will perform what procedure? And, and what? Something, Something like, okay, so. Pieces? Uh, you like the word, what is the most important or word that is missing? Pericardial. Of course, there you go. Oh, really? Pericardial synthesis. I had, well, I had um, stretch, and it went into like the layers. The heart? Mm -hmm. The heart. And so Did you have rheumatic like, heart disease? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No? No. And I, they put in a stint. Okay. So whenever you have a condition of the heart called uh, pericarditis, and apparently when you have pericardial effusion, the problem is that it will restrict the pumping action of the heart. You perform a procedure by the doctor, assisted by the competent nurses from this group called pericardial synthesis, C-E-N-T-E-S-I-S, -E -E which means what? The doctor needs what? A needle and a syringe that's sterile. And we have to wear a lab gown. I need a, what kind of container would I get? Clean or sterile container? So I get a specimen. I look at the color of the specimen. I send it to the lab for two things. One is to do a what? pericardial fluid culture and sensitivity testing, which you know we've taken microbiology, to determine if it is due to a what? Bacterial infection. And we can be able to grow the organism by putting the specimen in a culture medium. 
or the other parts of the specimen will be sent to the histopathology lab to detect the presence of what? Malignant cells or cancer. So we are men and women of science. That's why we need men and women like you to become scientists. And that's how we deal with our patients because here we're here to save lives. That's why there is a level of intelligence that we want our students to develop. We want our students to be smart, competent, and critical thinkers. You understand what I mean? Okay. Now, on the other hand, how many of you have been shot or stabbed in the chest? No one yet? Okay. It can happen in the future, so let's find out what happens. A patient got stabbed or a gunshot wound. What do you think will happen when you get stabbed? What? Your blood pressure Well, I'm talking about, now remember, our thread is about the pericardium. What was going to happen? Yes? Stop wound, gunshot wound. Now I know you have no experience. Let's pretend you were shot. Don't you watch movies? <laughs> huh? Okay, probably that you'll be dead by then, right? So let's say um, only to the pericardium. The fluid. Okay, what fluid is this? I know, but will the bullet hit the pericardial fluid? No. Okay, let's do an experiment. Get a gun and shoot yourself. Of course, my... Don't you watch movies? When you watch a movie, somebody gets shot, what happens? Is that going to be pericardial fluid oozing out? What comes out? Of course. I don't have to shoot you to show that the blood will come out. I do not have to stab you. I'm just joking, of course. So what, what do you make it so complicated? Okay, let's say a patient was shot and gunshot wound involving, because if it was the heart, you'll be dead. Because the heart will stop pumping blood, right? Let's make it more interesting. The bullet penetrated the pericardial cavity, so obviously there will be what? Bleeding. So now, what will be found in the pericardial cavity? The bullet. Well, most likely not. <laughs> and you imagine the bullet went through the heart and then said, I will stop here in the pericardial cavity. I like it here. The bullet said to itself. That can never happen, right? No. Because the heart is soft tissue, most likely it will either go through and through, unless it hits a, a, a rib and ricochet, goes back to the heart, and then back, back to the heart again. Amazing. Amazing, right? Amazing. So anyway, so let's pretend you were shot, and this happened to a friend of mine one time. We were resident physicians in the hospital, at the Philippine Jail Hospital. And when you look at him, it's like a, 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 a Taiwanese tourist, but he's, he's Filipino, so he was walking. And he had, he had a, a Taiwanese girlfriend with, with, uh, with him walking in the nice, uh, right beside this beachfront, you know, it's uh, Ross Boulevard. So he was walking there and working in the hospital was working. Guess what? Somebody shot him, thinking that he was what? A rich tourist. In fact, he was so poor, you know, because our, our salary was so low. And the good thing was it, uh, it hit the, uh, the, the heart, but not just the pericardium, and mostly the lungs, so it developed what? Hemothorax and pneumothorax. Blood in the pleural cavity and air in the pleural cavity. So he was saved because he was able to drain what? The pericardial uh, cavity blood at the same time what? The blood inside the pleural cavity. So that's what happened. It was amazing. He survived the incident because he was shot in the chest, okay? Now, we also know that in the heart, as we said, we have the three layers of the heart wall. So if I say you have endocarditis, which one is inflamed? The endocarditis. When I say myocarditis, which one is inflamed? And obviously it affects the pumping action of the heart, right? What about if I say pericarditis, the pericardium? Now, in the heart, the two chambers on the right are called right atrium, right ventricle, and on the left, left atrium and the left ventricle. What is the name of the blood vessel? that brings blood to the right atrium. Superior vena cava and? Which is this one here. Now why do you think the color of this blood vessel blue? And the oxygenated means more of carbon dioxide, right? And what is carbon dioxide? Something we do not need, it's called waste. Where did it come from? In the case of the inferior vena cava, the veins came from where? 
feet, leg, and thigh, and then you come to the inferior vena cava, and then goes here, which just makes sense. On the other hand, the veins of the head, the neck, and the upper limbs, where do they go? Which makes sense, the pyramids above the heart, right? So they all go to the right atrium. What is the name of this valve here, between the right atrium and right ventricle? Tricuspid valve. Go to the right ventricle, and then pulmonary valve, or pulmonary semilunar valve, then what? Pulmonary trunk, which is this one here, see? See this pulmonary trunk? And then eventually where? The pulmonary artery to the lung, there's one to the lung, another one to the right lung, pulmonary arteries. There are only two, one to the left lung and the right. And in the lung, what happens? There will be exchange of gases. You exhale the carbon dioxide, you inhale what? Oxygen. So I think of the red blood cell as a red bus. When the red blood cell is attached, that the CO2 is attached to the red blood cell. But the time it reaches the lung, it's like a passenger who has to disembark. The red blood cell will open the door, the uh, carbon dioxide gets out, and who will become the new passenger in the lung? Oxygen. oxygen. Oxygen comes in. And how does the oxygen in the red blood cell go back to the heart via what blood vessel? The pulmonary vein. So that don't get confused. A lot of people get confused with these two. The pulmonary veins is unique because it's the only vein in the world that carries what? Oxygenated blood. That is razor wise red. How many do we have in the left lung? From, from the left lung, two, one, two. And what about from the right lung? One, two, I know how to count. I'm just kidding, of course. By the time it reaches the left atrium, it goes to what valve? Martel or bicuspid valve, left ventricle, then what? Aorta, so the aorta goes like this, goes up, passing to the aortic semilunar valve. Aorta, this is called the brachiocephalic artery. Left common carotid artery, left subclavian artery. The left subclavian goes where? Sub means below the clavicle. Then the same artery will just change name. In the axilla, it will now be called what? Axillary. Axillary. In the arm, it will be called what? Brachial. Then in the forearm, it will divide into radial and what? Distal arteries, which is very amazing, right? On the other hand, the left common carotid in the neck, so you have your carotid pulse here, divides into two, external and what? Internal carotid arteries. Internal goes inside the brain to form your what? Cerebral arteries. On the right side though, there is what we call the brachiocephalic. The brachiocephalic divides into two. Right subclavian, same thing happens in the arm, and then what happens? Uh, right common carotid to the brain. In other words, on the right, you have a brachiocephalic that divides into the right common carotid and right subclavian, but here on the left, there is no brachiocephalic artery, okay? Now, you might be wondering, do I need to know that detail, Dr. Gamo? Yes. For example, remember we talked about strokes before. If the clot came from the left ventricle, can it go to the brain? Yes, why? From the left ventricle, aorta, on the left side, it will go to the left common carotid, then internal carotid, then cerebral arteries. It's called the cardioembolic stroke. Cardio means heart. The embolus or the traveling clot originated from the heart. And this will come out in the nursing board exam. You will be shown a picture of the heart and they'll ask you, where, did, where do you most likely get a clot that will lead to a stroke? The answer will be what? Number one will be left ventricle, number two will be left atrium especially when you have atrial fibrillation. You know, we'll talk about that later on, when there's an irregular rhythm of the heart. On the other hand, if the clot is on the right side of the heart, where will it go? To the lung. And you end up with pulmonary embolism. So any clot in the veins, any clot in the right atrium and the right ventricle will lead to what? Pulmonary, pulmonary embolism where you have chest pain. Can that be fatal? Can that lead to death? Definitely, there's a reason why we want you to be aware of that. This is a review. Remember, when people have thrombophlebitis, there's redness, there's pain in the leg due to lack of mobility or lack of exercise. Will you exercise that leg? No. no. Definitely not. What happens if you do? The thrombus becomes an embolus. It travels from the leg vein to the vena cava, 
to the right atrium, right ventricle. It doesn't stop there. Pulmonary, pulmonary trunk, it doesn't stop there because it's a big trunk. But where does it stop? In the lung, in the pulmonary capillaries. You have sudden onset of chest pain and respiratory distress, or what we call SOB, or shortness of breath. And can that patient die? Yes. Yes. Yes, you have a question? Oh, that's, you're going to be talking about, that's going to be about heart failure. Okay, left-sided heart failure. That's different, okay? Now, the bottom line, therefore, if you know your anatomy, there is no question in the nursing exam that you can't answer. Believe me. There is nothing that you cannot answer. Because if you know what is normal, then you know what's abnormal. And if you know what is the abnormal pathology of this patient, you know the treatment plan. Like example, in class, you can either give an anticoagulant or what? Thrombolytic drug. Which do you think is best? Anticoagulant or thrombolytic drugs? Because what does a thrombolytic drug do? What? Exactly. Lytic means dissolve. On the other hand, anticoagulants such as heparin and warfarin or what we call coumadine can only prevent further clot formation. Prevent further what? Prevent what? Further. I want precise answers. I do not want incomplete answers. My camera is a slow battery. My goodness. You understand? Okay. Now, thrombolytic drug like streptokinase, abokinase, gamokinase, okay. will dissolve the clot, right? Now, so we thought about in terms of the chambers, the, the valves, what do valves do? Prevent what? Backflow of the heart, right? Uh, if it went from the right atrium to the right, it should never go back to the right atrium. It already went to the right ventricle. And it also allows the blood to flow in one? Direction. It's like the band, one direction, the band, remember? <laughs> okay, now, what causes the heart muscles to contract? The pacemakers of the heart, right? In the uh, right, the wall of the right atrium, the AC node, AV node, atrioventricular node in between the atrial and the ventricles, and then what? Bundle of his, right bundle branch, left bundle branch, and then the Purkinje fibers, right? So apparently, these pacemakers are responsible for providing what? Electrical stimulation to the heart, right? So let's pretend this is the heart. Okay, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. That is the septum there. What valve is found here? What valve is found here? And then this is what? The aortic valve. I'm sorry, the uh, pulmonary valve. What do this mean? Aortic seminal valve. Now I did this this way so that you know how the blood will flow. What will be found here? Superior vena cava and then what? And then this came from where? Veins of what? Head, neck, and upper extremity. What about this one? Veins from where? Lower extremity, lower thoracic, abdominal pelvic organs. Okay, so the SA node will be here, AV node, bundle of his, right bundle branch, RBB, left bundle branch, LBB, Purkinje fibers, Purkinje fibers, both Purkinje fibers on the right and the left will stimulate what? The ventricular chambers of the heart. When the SA node sends a signal here and there, the presumption is that the blood came from here and the blood came from where? Pulmonary what? Made from the lung, full of oxygen. So when the blood goes here and goes here, it will be at the same time. What it gets full, this has to be closed, this will be closed. What happens? SA node stimulates both chamber here, bam! The muscles contract, blood will flow at the same time. This will open, this will remain closed, okay? Now, as the blood is going down this way, what happens to the electrical impulse? It also tra travels this way at the same time. How precise? Very precise. So as the blood flows, this will also flow. By the time this gets filled, guess what happens to the Purkinje fibers? Bam! They contract, this goes to the lung, this goes to the aorta, all the other organs of the body. Do you understand? So I might as well talk about Electrocardiogram. What is electrocardiogram for? It measures the electrical 
It's a recording of the electrical activity of the heart, ECG, electrocardiogram. It has this, look at these waves. Are you familiar with the song ABC? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, B, Q, R, S, T, U, and me. We're going to study the ECG. Boys and girls, come sing with me. Let us sing the ECG. <laughs> okay. P wave. This one. Q, R, S, T. P wave, QRST, complex T wave. What is the electrical event? The first one. It's called, for P wave, it will be what? Atrial. Depolarization. What is the mechanical event? Mechanical event is atrial what? Systole or contraction. Are you following me? What about the QRS complex? Ventricular one. Depolarization leading to what? When you depolarize to stimulate the muscle, what will be the effect on the muscle? Contract. Have you forgotten your physiology? For, forgetfulness is not good. Remembrance is important all the time. What is the opposite of depolarization? Very good. And what is repolarization ligand going to lead to? Of course! Diastole or what? Relaxation. What is the opposite of muscles contracting? Muscles relaxing. Where did we learn all of that? Anatomy and See, I just told you. I just told you. It's always about A and P. Okay. So how do you know a patient has chest pain? How do you know that there is an elect uh, problem here? Okay, look at this. Remember when you, when you have what? Q! MI is what? A deep Q, right? And then you have T wave what? Inversion. What is T wave inversion? Instead of going up, it goes what? It goes down. And all that they say is ischemic findings, but it could also be an MI. What is ST elevation? When the, what, remember this? If the SST is straight, straight, high, in the isoelectric line, what happens? It goes up like this. S to T is elevated. Okay, and we'll talk about that later on. Okay? How would you, okay, so let's talk about what's the difference between ischemia, myocardial ischemia, and myocardial infarction. Very simple. If you notice here, if I were to get rid of these and put the lower left ventricle here, and this is the aorta here, there are two branches, the coronary one. The coronary artery is the main blood supply to the myocardium. It carries oxygenated blood. If you have a fat deposit there called atherosclerosis plaque, what will it do to the blood flow? Less, because of the decrease in the rages. And what is, what is the term used to mean decreased blood flow? Perfect. That's the reason why in patients with atherosclerosis and hyperlipidemia, high levels of lipid, will you have ischemic heart disease? It's called ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, atherosclerotic heart disease. Do they mean the same thing? Ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, Atherosclerotic mean the same thing, okay? Will that lead to angina? Yes? So because why? There's decreased blood flow, there's chest pain, right? Now there are two types, stable and unstable. Which one is precipitated by exercise and relieved by rest? Stable. stable. Which one is not relieved by rest? Unstable. Which one is not because of fat deposit, but rather the muscles here. Remember there are smooth muscles in the tunica media? If they go into vasospasm, what's the term we use? Prince metal angina. Why is it called Prince metal? It has nothing to do with fat deposits. The vasospasm of the smooth muscles here contracting, leading to vasoconstriction, there will be decreased blood flow. That's the reason why they complain of what? Chest pain. And what's the drug of choice? We give calcium channel blockers. Because in order for the muscles to contract, what does it need? 
When you block the calcium channel, there is no calcium, the muscles will what? Relax, and that will lead to vaso what? And will that help relieve the chest pain? Yes. Yo. Now what about here in ischemic heart disease? Do we give nitroglycerin to this patient? What does nitroglycerin do? It's a vaso. Right. It's most likely to make the muscles relax. And when you vasodilate, will that increase the blood flow? Yes. Will that help relieve the chest pain? Is that the reason why it's called anti-anginal? Yes. yes, it is. Now, on the other hand, if you give nitroglycerin, what do I tell the nurse to monitor? Will that affect the blood pressure of the patient? Yes. Because now drug is taken here, it goes into the blood circulation, it can affect the peripheral arteries. When you vasodilate, what will be the effect on your blood pressure? It's called hypotension. So let's say I tell the nurse, give five milligrams sublingua or medication skin patch on the chest. After give, at six in the morning, at 6.15, you call me, Dr. Gamo, the patient drop blood pressure dropped from 120 to 100 systolic. I tell the nurse, I want you to lower the dose from five milligrams to 2.5. Then tell me what happens next. Oh, patient further, still the same, drop. So I, what, what would I say? Maybe lower the dose or maybe I must think of another drug to give the patient. Do you understand? Okay. Is that clear? Now, what is an MI? Here, the cells are not dead yet. Remember? Hydropic swelling. There is no ATP because there is decreased blood flow, there is decreased oxygen. The sodium potassium pump is not working. You're not able to throw out sodium. Sodium remains inside the cell. Sodium will attract the water going to the cell. There is hydropic swelling here. What is an MI? It's irreversible. The cells are dead. Why? When the fat deposit gets bigger and bigger, the blood flow becomes slower. And you form a big blood what? Blood clot. So you have two problems this time. Fat deposit and a clot. Right? So when there's a clot, there is zero blood flow. Zero blood flow. There is no oxygen. It's called MI. They're dead. Now how do you differentiate that from angina and ischemic heart disease? Aside from electrocardiogram, what is the other thing we need to do? Biomarkers. What's another name for biomarkers? Now let me just answer my own question because I have no more time. Time is of the essence here. Cardiac enzymes or biomarkers such as CPKMB, not the MM, MM for muscle, MB particularly for the heart. What about LDH or lactate dehydrogenase? What about serum troponin levels? So that means I have to get the blood specimen. Why? If this is the myocardial cells, the CPK, the troponin is inside the cell. When there is no blood flow, what happens to the cell? It dies. What happens to the cell membrane? It ruptures. It's destroyed. Where do you think these enzymes and biomarkers go? Blood. Into the capillaries. And what happens to the blood levels of these cardiac enzymes? So that's the best way to say, hey, you know what? This patient has what? An MI because of the elevation of the cardiac enzymes. That's why in your book, there was a uh, tabulation. ST elevation, non-ST, when does it become an MI? When there is what? Because you can have a non-ST elevation with no MI, when the enzymes are not elevated. You could also have an ST elevation with an MI when the enzymes are, so it is the determining factor. So a patient comes to the emergency room, chest pain, that's substantial as if there's an elephant on his chest, Substernal means below the sternum, radiating to the arm, the forearm, the hand, the jaw, bang, with elevation of the cardiac enzymes, bang, presence of Q waves, that's it, MI. The best way to get admitted is to tell the nurse, I have, I have chest pain. <laughs> Even if you're smiling, they have no choice. If you're just malingering, what is malingering? Pretending to be sick. I have chest pain, nurse. I know you have no choice, you have to admit me, right? I just want to have a free board and lunching. <laughs> Joke only, okay? Now, this is seen here, right? So when you have like this, remember this? Electrocardiogram, I see you monitor. This to this equidistant, okay? It's called regular sinus rhythm from the word sinoatrial node. What happens if you have an arrhythmia? <laughs> <coughs> I 
I'm ready. I'm having an MI. <coughs> flatline. What does a flatline mean? No electrical activity. And if there is no electrical activity, there is no contraction. You go into cardiac arrest or what we call a standstill. <coughs> flatline. Flat line. No electrical activity. No mechanical event. That means there is no what? Contraction. You're dead. That's the reason why there is no. There is no. There is no. You stop breathing. Why would you become unconscious? Because there's no pump, pumping blood where? Is it so beautiful? Everything's so simple. Don't you love anatomy and physiology? Sir, sir, are you okay? No response. Of course. Because there's no more blood going to the brain. No. Now, when I say that, don't be offended. Some people, Dr. Gamo, you are so arrogant. You make us look so dumb. No. It's like my kids when they say, Dad, no. Don't you know this thing? I said, well, yeah, you're right. Should we keep it simple, right? Heart stops pumping blood. No blood to the brain. You become unconscious. No pulse because there's no blood flowing to the coronal carotid. Check for the pulse. Stop breathing because there's no more blood going to the lung. You're dead. And that's why you do what? CPR. CPR and automated external defibrillator. It's not automatic, by the way. It's automated external defibrillator, or what we call what? AED. In the hospital, we have the big defibrillators. Stand clear, arm clear, everybody clear. Stand clear, everybody clear. No response after 30 minutes of intensive CPR. Time of death, 7.45 a.m. Signed, Dr. Gamo, assisted by Kelly Romero, the nurse, and Karen Ong, they were all my witnesses that this patient is dead. <laughs> Despite heroic measures, patient died, okay? So the bottom line, therefore, is that we do all these things in the hospital. So we want you to understand what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to look at this, ECG tracing. Now, I said you might be saying, oh, do I really need to know it now? Yeah, of course, because it's in your book, right? And besides, we talked about, even, remember, did you not do ECG tracing answers in physiology? Did you not try doing the, yeah. the, you did, right? Okay, very good. So the bottom line is that we are here to save lives. So when you are wa watching a patient on an ICU, are you going to be using a, looking at your Facebook account? Then all of a sudden, the patient has what? A Q wave. Notice a deep Q wave is what? One, two, three. One, two, the two parts are below. Regularly, it's only what? Cute, very cute, small. <laughs> so when you see something like this, and you see something like that, burn. OMG. Especially if it's going to be me, your patient. Oh, Dr. Gamo has a Q wave. He's going to die. I want him to die. <laughs> he gave me a hard time in pathophysiology. It's payback time. And I would tell you, thank you. I want to die, actually. <laughs> I'm already 85 years old. I have done my part in this world. I want to meet my mom and my dad and my brother. They're all up there. So hopefully, I'll also go up there if I'm good, I hope. If not, I'll be going down there, OK? I have to bring my own air conditioning unit. <laughs> OK, do you understand? now? So you see the big difference, right, between these two, okay? Now, so we talked about the heart. Now, I forgot to mention this. This will not come out in the quiz today, but for the, the, the midterm exams. When you're dealing with the heart, you're supposed to what? Use the stethoscope, right? The valves, okay. If this were the clavicle here, clavicle there, this is the sternum here, okay, cyphoid process, the body, the manubrium, and then what? The ribs. First rib, second rib, third rib, fourth rib, fifth, sixth. What do you call the space between the first rib and the second rib? First, ICS. What does ICS mean? Intercostal space. So second, third, fourth, fifth. Always remember, when you're taking an exam for nursing, board exam, Look at this as if this is your patient looking at the patient like this. So which one is my right? Which one is my left? So when you see this in the midterm or finals, if there is a diagram, if I put a diagram, don't ask me, sir, which one is the right? 
which one is the left. If I would not put that there, I expect you to know, especially the nursing board exam. Okay, I want you to write this down. First space, second, right? Here you have the aortic valve. What does that mean? Aortic valve, this is the best place to put the stethoscope, to auscultate for anyone. Aortic valve murmurs. Murmur is an abnormal sound. The first heart sound, love. Second heart sound, dub. Closure of what? Tricuspid and mitral or bicuspid. What about the second heart sound? Closure of the pulmonary and aortic semilunar what? Valves. So remember that. Make sure you know that. That's basic anatomy. Aside from the heart sounds, tick, 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 or lub dub, lub dub, you also want to see heart murmurs like tick, tick, shh, tick, tick, shh, instead of tick, 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 it will be tick, tick, shh, tick, tick, shh, tick, tick, shh, murmurs. P, T, M. Aortic valve. Answer. Second ICS, right parasternal border. What do we mean Beside the sternum, second intercostal space. Everybody palpate your clavicle. Palpate your first rib, second rib, so first space. Second and third rib, second space. On the right side, this is where you put for the what? Aortic valve on the right, the stethoscope, the diaphragm. Where do you put the ear piece of the stethoscope? In the ear. Don't you love it? I love anatomy already. Pulmonic valve, pulmonic valve. Second ICS, left. Para what? Sternal border. What about the tricuspid valve? This one here. Second, I see, I'm sorry, fifth, sorry, sorry, sorry. Fifth, intercostal space, left, para what? Sternal border. And finally, what about the mitral valve? Fifth, ICS, LMCL. What does LMCL mean? Left, mid, clavicular, white. Line. What does LMCL mean? Left, mid, clavicular line. Now, I'm just telling you now, study this, okay? Very important. So, it's very important to note that these are the places of the stethoscope you want to listen to these heart sounds. There's a mnemonic device. A to men, you know? Men from the ape, planet of the apes. APTM. Observe too that these three are on the left side. This is the only one on the right side. In some reference in the internet, they would put the tricuspid valve on the right side. But for me, for consistency, instead of putting it on the right, I would prefer it on the left. That's what the most of the books would say. Do you understand? Okay. Now, what is this purpose? To listen or auscultate with your stethoscope for those valves that you might be able to have problems with, like we say. Aortic valve regurgitation, or aortic valve stenosis, or mitral valve regurgitation, where you have those heart murmurs. This is not the location of the valves. This is the location of the stethoscope's diaphragm if you want to listen or auscultate for any valvular disorders. Now, I want you to add, aside from the mitral valve, this is the same area for what? Acupal pulse, or the point of maximal impulse. What is PMI? Point, P-O-I-N-T, maximal impulse. Okay, so for example, why do we want to check for the apical pulse? When you give a drug for the heart failure patients called what? Digitalis, right? I think I placed it in the study guide. Digitalis, or what we call lanoxin, or digoxin, is the drug of choice for what? Heart failure patients. Why? Because it has a positive what? Inotrophic effect, which means it increases what? Contractility. Myocardial contractility. In simple terms, it makes the heart muscle stronger because the heart is failing. Second, it has negative chronotropic effect. What do I mean by that? It negative means to lower the heart rate. Let's say the heart rate is 160 per minute, it becomes what? 80, which is good, why? 
If the heart is failing, do you want the heart to be jogging at 160 bits per minute? <laughs> I'm really failing. You want it to what? Walk, chill. I'm really dying. What the heck? So give me Lanoxin. The problem is that before we give this drug, we tell the nurse check for what? Because if the apical pulse is less than, write this down, less than 60 bits per minute, are you going to give this drug? No. Because it might bring down to 30, you're going to kill the patient. It's called nurse induced death. You will lose your license and you will not be able to practice nursing anymore. How would you be able to recover your 150,000 investment? You cannot. The bottom line is that you have to be smart, not only to get your license, but to maintain and keep your license. An incompetent nurse will easily lose his license if he doesn't know and follow what the doctor says. Now, apical pass, what do they say? Mid-clavicular. So you will actually do this on your patient. Palpate for the clavicle. If you're a boy, get a girl to help you. But you'll actually have to chest the chest. Tell the female patient, ma'am, I'm a male nurse, I have a female nurse here, so that uh, you will be more comfortable. So clavicle, palpate. Everybody palpate your left clavicle. You go down. First space, second space, approximation only, third, fourth, fifth. Now, it so happens it's in the nipple. Are we going to use the nipple as a landmark? No, because if a woman has a big breast, the nipple will be down here. Are you going to put a stethoscope here? I don't hear any heart sound, Dr. Gamo. Duh. You only hear the bowel sounds there. So what are you going to do? Not use the nipple because the nipple could be here, could be there, there. What do you do? Gently what? So put your hand under the breast and then what? <coughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Gently lift the heart. <sighs> and then put the stethoscope underneath. Approximation. Do you understand? I'm not kidding. In the real world, you really have to do this. Believe me. Can you put the stethoscope on top of the breast? Are you kidding me? It's full of fat, adipose. What might that be able to hear, right? Especially well endowed women. There's no heart sound, doctor. Is she dead? Look, look, look at her, she's smiling at you. She says, you're stupid. <laughs> Sorry. Patient will say, you need to what? You can lift my breast. I, I'm also a West Coast student. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. So the bottom line, therefore, is that you know what you're supposed to do, okay? Now, what's the difference with the right-sided with left-sided heart failure? What's the difference? Very easy. Let's go back to this. Remember this? If you recall, with regard to the heart, RA, RV, LA, LV, pulmonary veins, lung, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, right? Neck veins, head and upper limbs, limbs of what? Thoraco, abdominal organs, and lower limbs. RV goes to what? The lung? Left ventricle goes where? Aorta and the systemic circulation. Okay? The bottom line, therefore, is that we need you to understand that if it's right sided failure versus left, very simple. Left sided, there are two types, right? Backward and forward. If left sided heart failure, backwards, the left side is failing, what does backward mean? The blood, the blood cannot go this way, where does it go? To the lung back flows to the lung. So the lung is filled with blood. You have what you call congestion or edema. What do you call the edema? Or what's another word for edema? Congestion. Lung congestion, pulmonary. That's the reason why it's called congestive heart failure. But in this case, the problem is in the lung. Now, what happens? You have what? What is dysmia? Because it's filled with, how can you have exchange of gases in the lung if it's filled with blood? What about orthopnea? The difficulty of breathing what? In the supine. Why? Because the, the, the entire lung will be filled with blood. What do they do? High back rest. What do you do when you do a high back rest? The blood will go down by gravity. That allows the upper part of the lung to have exchange of gases and re-expansion of the air sacs in the lung. What about paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea? What is paroxysmal nocturnal? Nocturnal night. Paroxysmal means... 11, difficulty breathing, wakes up at 12 midnight, wakes up, 1 a.m., wakes up again and again and again. Now, why? 
But they lie down, there's more accumulation of blood, they get have difficulty breathing. What about the one you mentioned? Froti, pink. Substance coming out from the mouth, what does that mean? There's blood in the lung, your pulmonary congestion. You're gonna die. <laughs> Not kidding you. I had a bad experience. I was a clerk, I was a forty medical student. I was so excited that I went to the ER. The first thing I saw was a patient with left side heart failure. In front of me was pink, frothy, like this. P P F R O H. Too late because there was maybe a hundred patients in the ER and he was just on one side. I felt so bad. I, I felt hopeless. I was a forty medical student, you know. And then of course you have what? What is Ross? or crackles, presence of new fluid in the lungs and blood. And what about the use of accessory muscles of breathing? Yes, okay. And what about cyanosis? Why would there be cyanosis? Why, because of what? We get not enough oxygen to the skin. Now, that's backward. Now, forward, you can just read the book. It says that there's not enough blood with decreased cardiac output that affects your blood pressure, other organs, like kidney, it goes into kidney failure. What about right side then? Backward failure. Backward. The right side is not able to pump to the lung, goes back to the neck veins. What happens to the neck veins? Distended. Or jugular veins. They become what? Distended. Okay, what do you mean by distended? Full of blood. Because it, it backflowed. What else? What's another word for distended? Engorged. Now you might be wondering why are you giving us those too many words? What happens during the nursing board exam? They do not use the word distended, but rather they use this word and you might not be able to recognize here. What is the success? What does, what is, how do people become successful? If they know a lot of words, vocabulary is very important. What else? The blood does not go to the neck or go to the neck, what else? It goes where? Lower. To the what? Lower Abdominal organs. You have hepato what? Splenomegaly, why? The blood goes into where? To the liver, it becomes enlarged with blood. Same with spleen. What about ascites? What is ascites? A lot of fluid in the peritoneal fluid. In the then you have ascites. What else? You have bipedal what? Edema. Why? Because it goes back to the legs from the inferior vena cava. Do you understand? So what's the drug of choice? Heart failure, you always give this talis. But whether this is here or there, long or here, but you give a diuretic yes. in the form of Lasix or furosemide. Why Lasix? It's a loop diuretic. What does it do? It acts on the loop of Henle to prevent what? Reabsorption of water in the loop of Henle. In other words, the water will just come out where? In the wee wee. I remember one time a patient was in left-sided heart failure with lung congestion. I told the nurse, give the nurse, or give the nurse, give the patient five milligrams of Lasix intravenous IVTT bank. Patient was like, <laughs> I can't breathe, muscles are breathing, <laughs> protein salivation after Lasix, bam! Patient felt better. Thank you, nurse, you just saved my life. What did you do? And the nurse said, Sir, I gave you Lasix, the trade name, and the generic name is furosemide. It's a loop, the diuretic, so it's actually the loop of Henley. I'm just kidding, of course, you did. <laughs> it prevented the reabsorption of water, therefore, the water is now in your euro bag called the wee wee bag. So that saved your life, but should thank Dr. Gamo for saving your life, and thank you for complimenting. I did save your life. I was the one who gave that Dr. Gamo. I was the one who injected you. Dr. Gamo is the only God giving the orders. No, I'm just kidding. So, so we work together, right? But you have to understand, why did they order LASIKs? Why? The action is fast. The onset of action is how fast will it act? Two minutes. Compare that with a, let's say, potassium-sparing diuretic like spironolactone or aldactone. The action is what? Or thiazide diuretics, two hours. So which one do you give in a patient dying? A drug that will act in two minutes or a drug that will act in two hours? Two minutes. Just, don't you love it so beautifully simple? <laughs> Keep it simple, student. I want this patient to live, I have to give Lasix. The only problem is non-potassium sparing, which means what will come out in the way is also what? Potassium. And what happens to your blood potassium levels? It's called hypokalemia. So do I tell the nurse to monitor the zero potassium level when we are the patient being given Lasix? Yes. Are we going, if it's low, are we going to give a banana? Yes. Because what does banana contain? Potassium. Or can we give KCL with cardiac monitor, you know KCL, potassium chloride? 
under cardiac monitoring. Do you understand, class? There's nothing difficult here. It's just a matter of physics and knowing your anatomy. Blood flow to the lung, blood flow to the organs. Do you understand? Now, when it comes to blood pressure, I hope you mem memorize the different stages. Prehypertension, normal is less than what? Over 80. What is prehypertension? Hmm? 120 to what? 39 systolic and diastolic would be what? 82. 89. What about stage 1? 142. 159 systolic. What about diastolic? 90 to 99. Very good. And what's stage 2? Greater than 160 over? Oh, perfect. Now, this is just a word of advice. When you're doing the signature assignment, you'll be asked, what stage is this patient in the signature assignment? Please, por favor. If you're asked, what is the answer, what do you do? You put the answer. You could either say stage one, stage two. The problem is that most people, what do they do? They stop there. They don't bother to what? They don't bother to? They don't bother to? They don't bother. And they get mad at me because why did I give you only five points instead of 10 points, Dr. Gamo? You didn't explain. That's why I said minimum of 10 pages. So you give me everything from what is normal, what is pre, give me all the values, and then finally, in the very logical say, okay, Dr. Gamo, the blood pressure is this, based on what you see in the tabulation, he is in what? This particular, I will not give you the answer, of course. You understand what I'm saying? Explain everything. The more you explain, the higher grade you get. You understand, okay? So, that's hyper. Now, what, what is this formula here? Cardiac output is equal to heart rate and stroke volume. Cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the heart per minute. What about stroke volume? The amount of blood pumped by the heart per beat. Heart rate, let's say 80 beats per minute. Stroke volume, the amount of blood pumped by the heart, what? Amount, blood, Per what? Per beat. To cancel the beat, cancel the beat, amount of blood per minute is in that cardiac output. That is how you derive the formula. Now, if I increase heart rate, will that increase the cardiac output or the amount of blood by the aorta? Of course. That's so when you exercise, cardiac output improves. Now, what about blood pressure? Blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times what? SVR, systemic vascular resistance. If I increase the heart rate, it will increase the cardiac output. If I increase the cardiac output, what will be the effect on blood pressure? It will also go up. That's the reason why when you exercise, does your blood pressure go up? This is the reason why. That is the scientific explanation. What about resistance? Remember the Porcell's law? R resistance is equal to 8 and L over pi R to what? the fourth. Does it make sense? If you increase or decrease the radius, what happens to the resistance? Increase. And if you increase the resistance, what happens to the blood pressure? It goes up. That's why if you decrease the radius by having what? A fat deposit in the aorta, what happens? Will your blood pressure go up? Yes. yes. It's called afterload. Preload after load. It will be hard for the patient's left ventricle to pump away. There's increased resistance because of the fat deposit there. Now, types of shock. What is shock? There's a significant drop in the blood pressure. What is the shock that is due to an infection? Uh, septic, septic shock. What about the shock that is due to allergy and anaphylaxis? What about due to burns? There you go. The hypovolemic shock, right? What about if it's spinal cord injury? Okay, what about if it's diarrhea? Okay, hypovolemic shock too. What about if it's a burn injury? Because you're losing a lot of fluid, right? And the treatment is the same. If it's hypovolemic shock, you replace the fluids. If it's bleeding, stop the bleeding, replace the blood. Do you understand? Have I covered everything in the study guide? More or less, I think, right? Talked about blood pressure. So the different types of hypertension, remember? Essential, primary, and secondary. <coughs> secondary is due to any other condition. Especially in young people, the most common is kidney disease, right? You know that, right? Did you cover everything? Blood pressure, cardiac conditions. Rheumatic heart disease is usually due to what? Strap infection in the throat, going to the heart, or to uh, immune condition, right? 
Uh, what else? Um, so uh, MI, we talked about MI, we talked about heart failure, of course shock, okay? Okay, that's it for today.